Hi folks, you are very welcome to this week's edition of uh, Genos Live. And it's an exciting one, and it's a particularly exciting one for me because I've been a great fan of Patrick McEwan's for many years. Patrick is probably the foremost expert on uh, breeding for performance, whether we're talking about sports performance or business performance uh, in the world. And we were really blessed to get him onto the program today before he disappears off for uh, an Australian tour. So before we dive into it, and by the way, start thinking about your questions. Before we dive into it, let me do the usual uh, preliminaries. Um, one of the things I just want to say to you uh, about one of the topics we talk about today, which is Patrick's book, and uh, Atomic Focus, is uh, if you're like me, you're a real Kindle person, then I strongly recommend that, yes, you get it on Kindle, but also get a physical copy. I'll show you later on why, but the illustrations inside it are just gorgeous. And of course, you can get it directly on the site there, as you can see uh, on the, the screen, or by uh, using your camera to read that QR code. It's going to disappear now. Don't worry, I'll bring it back in a couple of minutes. As ever, please, please, please pop into the chat where you're dialing in from. And also, let just tell us, have you any sort of a breeding practice of any kind whatsoever? And if you have, just pop a couple of comments in about it. You know, what is it? Where did it come from? Uh, what do you use it for? What benefit do you get from it? Because it's going to be interesting in the context of the conversation we're going to be having with Patrick in just a couple of moments. Here is the piece where I'll just tell you again about Genos International. We are an emotional intelligence organization. We specialize in helping people to show up to one another in a way that gets the best results for themselves and the organizations they work for. So we help organizations to build psychologically safe and emotionally intelligent uh, workplaces. We also certify people to do what we do. And we have about 7,500 certified practitioners worldwide. And a program, by the way, next certification program coming up just in about a week or 10 days. I think it's actually next week. Uh, so if you've been looking at getting an EI accreditation, uh, it, it, check it out. It's, uh, uh, it's accredited by the ICF. Uh, just by way of bragging, we have been one of the world's top emotional and or one of the world's top assessment companies, uh, according to trainingindustry.com for the last five years. So I think we do what we do reasonably well. In September, we'll be running the last version, uh, the last public version of our Leading with Emotional Intelligence program. We get a lot of demand for this as an in-house program, but sometimes we have individuals or clients who have individuals who want to be able to take the program without having to set up a group in-house. Uh, so we're doing one of them. It'll be last of 2022 in uh, September. And it really, it's a learning journey that runs over six sessions and helps you to become more empathetic, more connected, more emotionally aware of the people around you and to manage them for a greater connection, collaboration and communication. We're doing this program in, uh, co in collaboration with somebody you'll have seen on the program before, Kira Aspinall of uh, Pinpointing Potential, and she has delivered several dozen of these over the last couple of years. She really first class at this. As ever, uh, as a Genos Live uh, uh, participant, if you decide to sign up, make sure you use this code, the Live22. It'll give you a 10% uh, discount on the program. Uh, before we go into Patrick, let me tell you next week we have uh, Alison Graymon and she's going to be talking about coping fatigue, which is something that I think we've all experienced to a greater or lesser extent. The, that, that thing when you are just feeling worn out from having to stay resilient through challenging times. Uh, Alison is a fascinating speaker, has her own uh, live show, has a couple of best-selling books, and has a really practical model for dealing with this coping fatigue. So don't miss that. Um, you can find more details about that on our uh, Genos Live page on the uh, Genos Emotional Intelligence site. And uh, we're coming near the end of the first uh, season for this year of uh, Genos Live, and we've had a real who's who <clears throat> of people uh, with us week after week. Starting from the end of June, we will rest for the summer and we'll start again the second season in September. If you know anybody of the caliber of the folks that we've had on the program that you think would be a good guest, please let us know because there's still a few slots left between September and December. So I'm going to bring Patrick in in just a minute because I know that's what you came here for. But before I do, let me see what Aoife can tell me about what you're telling her on the chat. 
So, Afa, what are Hi, folks Jared. telling us? How are you today? I never better. The sun is shining, which in Nace is kind of kind of unusual. <laughs> it's good to be back with you, folks. Yeah, we have a lot of folks dialing in from all over the world as usual, um, and some good feedback shared with us in the chat as well. It seems like a lot of people have or are trying to have. A regular breathing practice so this might be kind of perfect timing we have some folks joining from india from romania mm -hmm. uh, sri lanka yeah uh, from sweden the uk nigeria sligo kazakhstan and ireland as well um a few folks have shared i am super curious about today and yeah. um, ian shared i'm trying not to over breathe in anticipation so there's <laughs> some good excitement there um helen shared with us that her physiotherapist works with the breath um and she's about to learn the oxygen advantage breathing with her health coach and she's done some of patrick's exercises before wow great um and marie shared that she's trying to implement a breathing practice channel breathing note she said trying yeah and i shared that she uses breathing practices before coaching sessions and um, to help her fall asleep and in general either to calm down if she's stressed or re um, to re-energize all depends on the speed and techniques of breathing. So sounds like we have a lot of folks that are kind wow. of new to the topic and also quite advanced as well. So folks, keep your comments coming in and we love to hear from you and I'm sure Patrick will be eager to hear as well. And thank you for that, Aoife. And just as I, I'm about to bring Patrick on, because we've got such a diverse audience from all over the world, let me tell you, and I'll ask um, uh, Patrick to address this in a moment, let me tell you that, that um, uh, Patrick does an accreditation program so that you become an Oxygen Advantage uh, accredited trainer. So if you're in India or Bangladesh or Romania or any of the other diverse places, keep that in mind. If this is a topic that really gets your socks rolling up and down, mm -hmm. there is somewhere to go with that program. Program. So with that said, let me bring on Patrick and say you're very, very welcome, Patrick. Thank you so much for taking the time. It's a pleasure. Thanks very much. Great to be here, Derek. And uh, it's great to see those questions coming in, Aoife. I already know yeah. that I have to be on my game because there's a few questions. I know that there's a few people who know something about breathing. Yeah, and there you and, go. Uh, yeah, del delighted to hear it. I was delighted to hear it. And you've got a couple of Oxygen Advantage fans there already. Um, uh, listen, be before, in case I forget before the end, I really want to say in front of folks, really appreciate you taking the time today because I know you're up to here getting ready for an Australian tour. So, so uh, really appreciate you carving out the time. Um, before we get into a conversation, let me let me ask Aoife. Aoife, will you do a kind of a formal introduction? of uh, Patrick and then we'll get into uh, a, a chat with Patrick. Of course. Well, Derek, it sounds like a lot of people have already had the pleasure of, of either reading Patrick's books or going through some of his exercises. Um, but for those of you that haven't yet um, had the pleasure, Patrick is the creator, CEO and director of education and training at Oxygen Advantage. He is a leading international expert on breathing and sleep and author of multiple best-selling books, including the Oxygen Advantage. And his focus is to empower more people every day to breathe better, feel better, and achieve their potential. For the last two decades, he has provided breathwork training and breath-based sports and mindfulness coaching to thousands of people. In that time, he has written best-selling books and been awarded fellowship by the Royal Society of Biology in the UK. And you know, in his spare time, also trained hundreds and hundreds of breathing instructors as well. Um, and since 2002, he's worked with thousands of clients, including elite military special forces, Olympic coaches, and athletes. One of the books we're highlighting today, Atomic Focus and The Breathing Cure, are his latest books, which we will be sure to link to after the session. So make sure you are subscribed to Genos Live to get those links. And really excited that you know Patrick shared with us, healthy breathing changed his life for the better. And today, we're hoping he's going to share how uh, we can learn how to change our lives for the better through breath. So thanks for being with us, Patrick. I'm going to hop off behind the scenes, keep an eye on the chat, and uh, I'll give Derek in a wave when we have uh, some questions and some feedback for you. So have a great session, everyone. Thanks, Seifa. Thank you very much indeed. So, so why don't we start? Because we've got, we've got a mixed bag. We've got people who have been uh, through the program and who know instructors and have read your books. And then we have folks who don't have a really se real sense of it. Can you tell us a little bit, Patrick, about the, the connection between the autonomic nervous system, your breathing, and how that affects pretty much everything about our experience of, of, of our lives day to day? 
I suppose, Derek, if I was to look back the last 20 years, the, the best insight that breathing has gave to me is the ability to change states. Mm. I came out of business school, I did BESS and TCD, <clears throat> our Trinity College in Dublin for those people outside of Ireland. And I just felt that when I came out, I was totally ill-prepared for the corporate world. And I wasn't able to deal with the stress in the corporate world. I hated it, I have to say. Now, for many years, I blamed the company. But more recently, I then started to realize it was actually my own physiology. I was, it, I was already in that fight or flight response, but I had undiagnosed sleep issues. And back in 1998, I came across a newspaper article about the importance of nose breathing and about breathing less air for short periods of time, because I was always stuck in that, that response of faster and harder breathing. And it's not as if you're having a panic attack. It just means your breathing is just a little bit faster and a little bit upper chest and a little bit harder. But that's keeping you stuck in this increased sympathetic or increased stress response. And the problem there is that it doesn't take much then to throw you over the edge. And that was the word resilience that came up earlier on from one of your next speakers. I can't remember her name, but when we change our breathing practice, we can improve our resilience. And resilience now can be measured via heart rate variability, which gives you an objective measurement of vagal tone. I taped my mouth closed back 20 plus years ago. I was chronic mouth breather waking up with a dry mouth in the morning. And I remember the first morning waking up, I can't really, wasn't all that much of a change. The second night I taped my mouth again, I did wear nasal dilators, but I would show people how to decongest your nose. Mm. And I woke up that second morning and it was the best night's sleep that I had in about 15 years. Now I'll give you a little bit of a backstory. I left school at 14 14 years of age. Okay. Never to go back. I was totally frustrated. I was the kid who was falling asleep. I I wasn't a troublesome kid, Mm. but I was the kid that was really challenged in the academic world. Right. And I had undiagnosed sleep disorder breathing, which, and having asthma, having a stuffy nose, going around my mouth open, fast upper chest breathing. And when I think about, you know, concentration and attention span, and we are sent to 16 or 20 years of formal education. Education requires us to be able to concentrate, but education doesn't give us the tools on how to concentrate. So we had these issues, and of course, I'm not unique. There are millions of children in the same and teenagers and many, many, the percentage of people with sleep issues in the corporate, in the, in the adult world. And of course, in the corporate world and in every walk of life, how can you reach your full potential? And I was listening to Stephen Kotler this morning talking about flow states and flow state is a, is a wonderful state. Yeah. It's a tremendous state, which that you're, you're totally absorbed in what you're doing, that you're hundred percent of your concentration is doing what you're doing but you're not going to achieve slow state flow state if you have sleep disorder breathing and you're not going to achieve flow state if your physiology is in that increased stress response. And I would go through the tools of that. So in order to have your full attention on doing what you're doing, you need to have deep sleep. And I'm not just talking about sleep hygiene. I'm not just talking about, you know, wear blue light filter glasses and have a cool bedroom, airy bedroom, dark bedroom, all that stuff is great. But the elephant in the room is how you breathe during the day will influence how you breathe during sleep. How you breathe during the day will also influence your resilience when it comes to a tricky situation. Mm. I'll give you this example. Dr. Rangan Chatterjee in the UK, he was interviewing a brain surgeon called Dr. Rahul. And this is a pretty... I can imagine a stressful occupation, you know, because literally you have somebody's life in your hands. Sure. And Dr. Rahul said, he says, when I get into a situation, the first thing I do is prevent myself from hyperventilating. Now, this is straight from the doctor's mouth. Yeah. Now, why doesn't everybody else know about this? You know, I was going into doing exams or going into do job interviews, but I have also, of course, interviewed people and I've seen them going into this hyperventilation. And when you go into that hyperventilation, and all that means is that your breathing is a little bit faster and harder. When your breathing is faster, harder, and upper chest, only by degrees, Mm. your body now is telling the brain that the body is under threat. And all the brain wants to do is to protect the body and get you out of the situation. So you have an individual going into the boardroom to make a presentation. And they're feeling that they're a little bit nervous about it. And their breathing starts to get harder and faster. Mm. And that individual is not going to perform as well. 
the student going into exams, the person going in, you know, in terms of job interview, etc. And I remember interviewing a few people back 10, 15 years ago. And I remember one, one girl came in, she was in her probably mid twenties and she was sighing frequently and she was up her chest during the interview. And then the next person came in after another female, similar age, very calm, collected breathing. And who did I choose? Of course I went with the second girl because, you know, intuitively I was wondering, well, is this person, the first person, her breathing was giving her away. Mm. Mm. When, and it's not just that I know a little bit about breathing, but we all intuitively realize that when people get into a stress response, they breathe that little bit faster and they breathe upper chest and they breathe harder. And if you're in a job interview, that person is telling me that they're not comfortable in the situation. And then yeah. I begin to ask them, well, are they going to be comfortable then if they come across any tricky situation? Because ultimately, the measure of a leader is going to be how well you perform when things go wrong. Mm. That's the measure of a leader, okay. but that's about changing your states and the universities do not. So we're coming out of business world, no matter what our training is, have we been trained to concentrate? Have we been trained to hold our attention? Are we resilient enough? And what do we need to develop that? And that's where I love to fill in because I just feel that breathing has been let down so many decades. Mm. There's too much, too much woo woo the robes, the beads, and all of the paraphernalia and all of that nonsense. And I'm going to say it's nonsense because it puts too many people off. Yeah. Every person should have an understanding, at least a basic understanding, that how do you deal with your physiology? Because by controlling your breathing, you can have some influence over the mind. And yeah. when we look at people with tendencies towards panic disorder and anxiety, which affects about 20% of the population, that's 20%, of the document, it's one in five. Hmm. Seventy-five percent of this cohort of individuals have dysfunctional breathing. They are not going to achieve self-actualization. And CBT and counselling, etc., brilliant, all good. Mindfulness, brilliant. They are not addressing dysfunctional breathing patterns. Okay. We need to get deep right, and we need to address dysfunctional breathing. So, so it, so, sound, it sounds like, from what you're saying, Patrick, and would it, tell me yeah. if this is an unfair character, uh, characterization that in the main, the majority of people, or a lot of people, breathe too high up in the chest, too, too, too hard and too fast. Is, is that the base, is that, is that correct to say? In, in the literature, in the population, it's about 25% of the normal population. Okay, okay. But then in, in different cohorts of the population, those people who need this the most are, are more likely to have dysfunctional breathing. But even females, because of the changes of hormones during the monthly cycle. Mm. So post ovulation, middle luteal phase, there's an increase in progesterone, which is a respiratory stimulant. Mm. And females are two to three times more likely to experience panic disorder than men. Mm. So with females, breathing can be a little bit more unstable. Now, at our breathing, I'm not going to say, of course, that, you know, everybody has dysfunctional breathing. No. Sure. Now, there sure. is a way to assess it. And this, this was something that we've been using for quite a long time. But it was recently put to the test in 2018, okay. and it's called the boat, the boat, the body oxygen level test. Right. So if anybody wants to give this a go, yeah, let's you do know, it. sit sitting down for about five minutes with normal breathing, okay. And then you take a normal inhalation through your nose that you don't hear it. So it's a normal breath in through your nose, and a normal breath out through your nose, and then you pinch your nose and you with your fingers and you stop breathing and you time it in seconds how long does it take until you feel the first definite desire to breathe and then you let go but you should have normal breathing when you let go now okay so was be, can, can we get people doing i i know the ideal is that they have five minutes to relax um uh, beforehand but can we can we actually talk them through it and have them do it in real time for a few seconds and just see yes. and see what sort of scores we get from from folks Yes, that would yep. be interesting. So I'll go through it again then. Okay, so, so folks, you're are you ready? sitting down comfortably. Okay. Don't worry about your breathing and don't worry about your score. It's only to give you a little bit of feedback. Okay. Take a normal inhalation. So it's a normal breath in through your nose. You shouldn't really hear it. It's a normal breath in through your nose and a normal breath out through your nose. And then you pinch your nose to stop breathing. And you're timing it in seconds. How long does it take? until you feel the first definite desire to breathe or the first involuntary movement of the breathing muscles that you feel a spasm in the diaphragm or in the throat. And when you resume breathing, 
Your breathing should be normal. So that's a key point of it. You're holding your breath but after an exhalation, but when you resume breathing, your breathing should be normal. You shouldn't have to take these full big breaths afterwards. And that's the bulk score. So Derek, yours is about 28 seconds. Now your breath at the end was just a little bit elevated. Yeah, it sure so was. It was amount. But <clears throat> this is, and it's kind of normal when people practice it, do that at the start that they have elevated breathing at the end. So with a little bit of practice, then you can kind of get it to the point. Now, where should it be? Kiesel's paper showed that with 51 individuals, if your bolt score is above 25 seconds, there is an 89% chance that this breathing is functional. Okay. So your it breathing is functional. functional. Is functional okay. once your bolt score is above 25 seconds. Okay. Now, if you're at 20 seconds, 22 seconds, 23, you're pretty close. Hmm. But what about the individual and their bolt score is 10 seconds and 15 seconds? There's a significant room for improvement. Now, what is the significance of this? in terms of the autonomic nervous system. And by the way, let me interrupt and, for one second. Folks, why don't you pop the score, if you feel comfortable doing so, pop the score that you got on the bolt in there, and when we bring AFA back in for some of the questions, we deal with that. Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Patrick. No, you're grand. And just in case people are wondering what's the autonomic nervous system, it basically means the automatic functioning of your body. You know, your body is doing all the great stuff that it's doing. You don't have to think about it. It's automatic. But you can influence this through your breathing. But if your bolt score is less than 25 seconds, and especially if it's down around 10 and 15 seconds, that implies that your breathing is that little bit faster. Mm. So your respiratory rate could be 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20 breaths per minute. Okay. Your breathing can be a little bit harder so that the volume of air that you're taking in with each breath is a little bit too much. Mm. It can be upper chest, or you could have, with that can be irregular breathing, mouth breathing, etc. Now, that will obviously then put you more likely into an increased stress response. Okay. And then your resilience is going to be impacted. And what this means is that just like me in the corporate world, I could not deal with situations because I'm already in that stress response. And if you're already in that stress response, it just doesn't take much to push you over the edge. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's yeah. very important that we understand, and I'm going to put this out there, there's a few breathing myths out there. One mm. is take the deep breath. That's a terrible, terrible instruction to give people. Now, the, the instruction itself is actually okay, but the interpretation of it is not okay. Mm. We, we also have a belief out there that the more air you breathe into your body, mm. the more oxygen delivered throughout the body, and that is not correct either. The first one I'm going to address, when you breathe in and out through your nose, you're more likely to have better recruitment of the diaphragm from breathing muscle. Yeah. And your diaphragm breathing muscle is separated. Basically, it's just at the base of your ribs here. Mm. And it's, separa it's separating the chest from the, from the abdomen. Breathing low is very important because your diaphragm breathing muscle is connected with the emotions. When you're breathing low, there's a better gas exchange taking place from the lungs into the blood. When you're breathing low, you've got spinal stabilization. So, for example, 50% of people with lower back pain have dysfunctional breathing patterns. Okay. So breathing low is one thing. <laughs> But another thing that we need to be thinking about, and breathing low and breathing deep are the same thing, mm. but you can have a, a low breath. So I'm breathing in, and I'm breathing out. Mm. That's a deep breath. Right, right. All of this right. is a low breath. Yeah. But if you ask somebody off the street, take a deep breath, they'll take, <sighs> <sighs> and that's, not, that's a big breath. I did that going into an exam back in 97 after reading a book um, and the, the instruction in the book was to slow down your respiratory rate to one breath per minute or two breaths per minute. Mm. I was anxious enough going into the exam, I took a walk and I started filling my lungs full of air and even though I was only taking maybe three breaths per minute, I was taking full big breaths yeah. and I walked in, all I did was for about three or four minutes, I walked into the exam hall, it was totally all over the place, disoriented, lightheaded. Yeah. Yeah. And I couldn't, I couldn't hold my attention because the harder you breathe, the more air you bring into your lungs, you get rid of too much carbon dioxide yeah. Yeah. from the lung and from the blood. And the loss of carbon dioxide causes your blood vessels to constrict. So we need to address that myth. Don't have a belief that it's good to be taking big breath. Yeah. It's not good. Now, 
People, of course, are going to ask, well, what about the Wim Hof technique? The Wim Hof technique is a stressor. He is a, he's an extreme athlete, okay? Mm. And he wants to push his body and push it hard to cause his body to make adaptations. We are not all extreme athletes. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. for many people, we have to tailor breathing exercise according to the individual. So I'm going to give you just a basic overview. The autonomic nervous system, we need to have in balance. Mm. We need to have a balance between the body's rest and digest response and the stress response. If we want to downregulate, if we want to dampen the stress response and increase the relaxation response, breathe nose, breathe light. In actual, breathe less air for a period of time to stimulate the vagus nerve. Breathe slow for a period of time to stimulate the vagus nerve. Breathe low. So to downregulate, nose breathing during wakefulness and sleep, breathe light for periods of time to help with recovery, breathe slow and breathe low, and relaxation and massage and humming, mm. guarding of the throat, all of those things can help with downregulation and recovery. If you want to stress the body, you do maximum breath holds, or you take full breaths. Yeah. And all you have to think of it is, there's a time that you want to stress your body. If you feel, for example, you, you want to push it a little bit, but do it within your limits. Do it within sure. your limits. We do breath holding all the time. We drop the blood oxygen saturation. Um, we do hyperventilation techniques. However, any time you stress the body and mind, always think about recovery. Yeah. And often yeah. that's missed. For me, the recovery and the resilience component here is very important because many people are, are already in this they're already in this stress response and they've got a lower bowl score. Their breathing is harder and faster. They're waking up exhausted in the morning. They're waking up with a dry mouth and that's going to impact their resilience. Now, I gave a talk in London there on Saturday morning, the Health Optimization Summit. I was speaking to about seven or 800 people. I have always my own daily routine. I'll just explain it briefly based on what we spoke about there. Mm. Actually, hold, hold that thought for one second, Patrick, because I just sure. I just want to check in because I bet you there's there's half a dozen things there that you've said that I bet you are going to have teased some of the folks that are listening uh, into sure. uh, some uh, pieces on the chat. So I'm wondering if, uh, first off, did we get any bold scores? And secondly, did we get any other questions on just what's what's gone so far? We did indeed. Thank you, guys. Um, a few people share the results with us. So... Here are a couple of them. So someone shared 14, uh, someone shared 45, uh, 18 seconds, 22 seconds, and 23 seconds. Um, and then we had a couple comments. Um, Ian shared that he has asthma, was never told to close his mouth by any doctor. When I was a mouth breather, uh, I was a super getter and a super spreader, and I didn't even know it. Uh, he also shared that he used to breathe through his mouth, and he changed to nose breathing by using the techniques in your book, Patrick, and that it has changed his life and has proved his health 15 to 20%. So wow. hard to quantify, but a it's lot. Here. Hmm. Yeah, and I'll yeah. give you another story about that, but I won't even go down that route. You know, I really feel for people with asthma and for kids and adults, and nobody's telling these people to breathe through the nose. And just, Aoife, it just does not make sense. You know, why let hmm. somebody with asthma go around with their mouth open, taking cold, dry, unfiltered air straight into your lungs, which is known to cause irritation of the airways. But people with asthma don't just have asthma. We're also more likely to have poor sleep. And because mm. of chronic mouth breathing as a child, it altered the shape of my face that my, my nose is crooked, my, my top jaw, the maxilla is set back, my mandible is set back. So children who are mouth breathing, they have poor sleep, mm. but they have also abnormal development of the face and more. So Ian, yeah, it's great to hear. and. I met with the powers of B back in 2005, but they pretty much silenced me and they didn't want this information getting out there. So I started writing books because I said, I want to get this information out there. And I wrote a book called Asthma Free Naturally back in 2003 and a book called Close Your Mouth to get it out to the masses mm. because I don't know why this simple stuff is just overlooked and people don't want to know about it, but we have to ask, mm. is it logical? Does it make sense? does it cause harm and nose breathing does not cause harm it's total mm -hmm. logic because the mouth does nothing when it comes to the breath you know if you were to look into somebody's mouth and you ask what does the mouth do zero functions 
so all the mouth is is, is an emergency. Yeah. So I think throughout our evolution, whenever we got into times of fight or flight, we it, it was immense physical exercise that was accompanying that situation. And we responded by mouth breathing and by faster breathing and by shallow breathing. But just as Ian said, uh, a super getter and a super spreader, if that's exactly his words. Mm -hmm. um, and that key is that you are in that stress response. And it comes back to, you know, conditions you know, you could say, well, the person with asthma is breathing harder and faster because of their condition, but we have to recognize it's the mouth breathing and the faster and harder breathing, which is feeding into their condition. Mm. And the same with mm. people with panic disorder and anxiety. And when we look at insomnia and obstructive sleep apnea and the link with depression. So when people look at breathing, we can't just look at breathing in isolation. We have to look at the mind mm. and we have to look at sleep. Those three, but of course, in modern me medicine, we see the human body as a, sing a series of different functions without realizing the bi-directional relationship between them. You know, so yeah, so that's great, great feedback. Interesting, between 14 to 45 seconds of a breath total time, you know, it's a huge variance. Yeah. We don't all do the same. Yeah, yeah, it's very different. I ju just curious, um, you, you really, you, you hit something when you were talking there, Patrick, that's that's personal for me. And I dare say it's it's an issue for other folks. There's a little five-year-old uh, man in my life, uh, and and I notice because I pay attention, you know, because of you, the, the the influence of your books. I notice him breathing through his mouth a lot. What do you do? How do you train kids without freaking them out? Um, you know, because you can say to an adult, "Hey, tape your mouth at night," and we can come back to that one if uh, people mm -hmm. haven't heard about it. But tape your mouth at night and and be more conscious. But what do what do you do with a uh, five-year-old Patrick? Uh, who is having these problems to train them into that? All of the exercises are free uh, on the Buteco Clinic app or if you go to butecoclinic.com. Yeah. Every exercise for children is free. We start off, first of all, by having them wear a tape. Now, by the way, I don't want to give a plug on it, but I just want to show you that there is a tape that is not so scary. Uh, this is our own tape. It's, it's called Myo Tape, but mm -hmm. it was developed initially for children and then we also developed it for adults. Now, this is the skin-colored one. So I stretch it about 30%. And yeah. I press it against my lips to get to adhesive, yeah. just to heat it up a small bit. Now, this is a training tool that we use for kids because sometimes working with children can be a little bit difficult. You know, kids are distracted, the mouth is open. This is an elasticated tape, which is bringing the lips together, but it doesn't cover the lips. So yeah. it doesn't cover the mouth. Yeah, yeah. So we start off with the child during wakefulness and we show them how to decongest the nose, which I'll go through. Mm. And then we have them do paces exercise, which you'll see on the app. So we want to help open up the child's nose and we want to help to restore the importance of nasal breathing for sleep, for craniofacial development, for their asthma, but also for their anxiety. And unfortunately, now we're seeing younger and younger kids having anxiety. Yeah, they're yeah. breathing fast, they're breathing up their chest. You know, the tape we have the kids wear during wakefulness. So right. it's not just about treating the nose, or I'm not going to use the word treat, but it's not just about helping to open up the nose. It's about changing the behavior. Right. So the kid now is watching television, and the child forgets about breathing through the nose. They open their mouth, but the, the tape pulls their lips together. Mm. And it's a constant cue to the brain to change the behavior. So all of the exercise for kids are free. And the other group of people that we put everything out for free were people with long COVID and people with COVID. Okay. So with children, it's all out there for free. Um, okay. COVID and long COVID. We don't look for email addresses, no mm. nothing. Mm. Nothing I can return, but it's there, yeah. Yeah, we, we put that, we'll put that up. So, so just, just to, 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 to tap into that a little bit more, because I know this, this is a recurring theme across all of your books and all of your work, is the whole thing of nose breathing. And you said already that the mouth does nothing useful. It doesn't filter. You're getting cold, unfiltered air, whereas the nose is filtering it, um, cleaning it of, um, uh, of undesirables, let's yeah, say, yeah. and warming yeah. up the air. What else? does that nose breathing do? Why does it have such an impact on, on your sleep, on your general health and so on? Why should people who have built years uh, of life practicing how to breathe through their mouth start to try and change that habit of a lifetime? What's in it for them? Oh, the benefits are it's enormous in terms of when you breathe through your nose, your breathing tends to be slower. 
Mm. So you've got a better oxygen transfer from the lungs into the blood. Slower breathing is very important for the emotions because there's a structure in the brain that's spying on your breath. And if you breathe hard and fast during rest, as I said earlier on, your brain does interpret that the body is under threat. Mm. Whereas if you want to downregulate, so say for example, you are going in to give a, an interview and you're feeling a little bit angsty about it and you're sitting outside the door and you're sitting in the chair, just take a soft breath in through your nose and have that slow and relaxed and prolonged exhalation. And by having that slow and relaxed and prolonged exhalation, your body is telling the brain that everything is okay, but you're more likely to do that with nose breathing than with mouth breathing. Yeah. Mouth breathing is a fast breath in and a fast breath out. Mm. So that's a stressor. Now, there's even more in terms of the nose, there's a gas called nitric oxide that when you bring it into your lungs, it helps open up the airways. It redistributes the blood throughout the lungs, but it's also antiviral. Mm. And that was the thing with COVID. There was, we were talking about COVID. Why, why? aren't authorities telling people to breathe in the nature of their nose. Mm. Your nose is the, the first point of defense yeah. against airborne viruses. Um, I remember being in a tube February of 2020 and COVID was just the initial stage and the tube yeah. was pretty full. Mm. And I was just thinking to myself, there were a few people around very yeah. close to me saying, any of these people could have COVID. I did two things on the tube. I breathed it through my nose. And I really slowed down and softened the volume of air that I was breathing in because I didn't want to take in too much. If there was a virus around in the atmosphere, I didn't want to take in too much of a viral load mm. because if I could reduce the viral load to my body, my at least my immune system might have a better chance of dealing with it. Sure. And that was one aspect of it. Of course, we were talking about washing hands and don't touch the face, but nothing about nose breathing, which is a little bit strange. And um, we select our mates based on the nose. So sniffing out danger. The, the nose is directly connected with the brain, but the mouth isn't. Our posture. Yeah. I remember being, I was at a medical conference in Rome in 2016, and it was a medical, it was medical doctors mainly. Uh, one of the medical doctors there from Italy, he showed a video of a patient walking down the corridor. He stopped the patient. He asked the patient to put the tongue up into the roof of the mouth, bring their lips together. Mm. Initially, the patient had a poor gait when he was walking down the corridor. When the doctor stopped him, tongue the roof of the mouth, lips together, straight after, the patient's posture improved. Wow. So our balance and our mobility and functional movement is related to breathing and with nose. For sleep apnea, I wrote a paper that was published in the Journal of Clinical Medicine. I wrote it with two ENTs, mm. looking at the connection between functional breathing and, and sleep apnea. When you breathe through your nose, your airway is wider mm. and there's less likely for the airway to collapse. And conversely, when you breathe through your mouth, your tongue is going to be resting low on the floor of the mouth. Your tongue is more likely to fall into the throat. Your lower jaw, the mandible, is falling back into the throat. You're reducing your airway size, which increases the risk then of the airway collapsing during mm. sleep, which would be, if it lasts for 10 seconds for an adult, it would be an apnea. Apnea. Your nose also, by being connected with the diaphragm, your diaphragm is also, by breathing low, you increase lung volume, which in turn stiffens the throat and mm. opens up the airway so it's less likely to collapse. So in terms of the major fields of people who come in, okay, on a health point of view, 30% of the people who come in to us have respiratory issues, 30% okay. sleep issues, and 30% for mental health. Mm. Nose breathing is the first foundation. Okay. Then we teach them to breathe light because I never realized when I started first focusing on my breathing and breathing less air, the temperature of my fingers started to improve. I always had cold hands and cold feet. Right. We are The 50,000 miles of blood vessels throughout the human body are influenced by the volume of air that we breathe. If we breathe hard and fast, and it just has to be a little bit harder and faster, mm. our blood vessels constrict. And there's less oxygen delivery throughout the body, including the brain. So when people talk about fatigue, you know, how can you be alert? Number one is if you're waking up at a dry mouth in the morning. Mm. Number two, if you're breathing a little bit faster and a little bit ch upper chest, because this is highly inefficient. Right. You know, there's a greater oxygen consumption by the body to support the breathing muscles when our breathing is dysfunctional mm. versus when our breathing is functional. So the nose, yeah, and there's nothing to do about this. Back in the 70s, uh, Dr. Morris Cottle, he said the human nose was responsible for 30 functions in the human body. 
wow. and both to breathe in and out through the nose not in through the nose and out through the mouth. If you breathe out through the mouth, you lose 42% moisture. Hmm. So the mouth breather is more likely to be dehydrated. The mouth breather is more likely to have gum disease, dental cavities, bad breath. The mouth breathing child is more likely to have overcrowding of teeth, hmm. narrow jaws, elevated palate, and the list goes on and on. And I'm gonna go just in terms of children you were asking about, if you go to PubMed, and you look up a study by Karen Bonnock, B-O-N-U-C-K. She, she studied 11,000 children in Stratford-upon-Avon over a four-year period or five-year period. And she published it in the journal Pediatrics in 2012. Children who had sleep disorder breathing at five years of age, and that's including snoring and sleep apnea. If untreated, these kids had a 40% special education needs by age eight. And the reason being is because the brain is developing during the formative years mm. and the brain develops during deep, good quality sleep. Mm. But if you have a child who is snoring or if you have a child who is stopping breathing and it's relatively common, sleep disorder yeah. breathing yeah. is 15 yeah. percent, 15% of children, those kid, kids don't thrive. Now, Derek, I find it so frustrating sometimes because mm. the simple information such as a child nasal breathing or mouth breathing, and the study showed that between 25 to 50% of study children are mouth breathing persistently. It does affect more boys than girls. Okay. But if it causes, mouth breathing is a hallmark symptom of sleep disorder breathing. If these kids have sleep disorder breathing, they're not going to reach their full potential. Right. You know, you look at, and you look at that, the kids who were involved with these massacres in the United States, many of them are in Ritalin. Many of them have ADHD. Yeah. That can be related to poor sleep quality, and there is a link, and you'll see it in Bonnock's paper, but you'll see it in other papers. Any child with ADD, ADHD, they're literally, they're thriving on adrenaline. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, their sleep yeah. quality has put them into such a stress response because they're not getting that slow wave, deep restorative sleep. If we want to be calm in body and mind, we need to get sleep right first, but breathing and sleep go together. Okay. If we're going around with our mouth open during the day, if we're mm. faster and harder breathing during the day, we're faster and harder breathing during sleep and possibly mouth breathing during sleep, sleep is impacted, but states of mind are impacted. And and just and and uh, so thinking about the folks who are on the call here today and, and, and sending them away with something that they can do right away. The first thing that I'm taking really strongly, and I, I don't think anybody will mistake the message uh, there, is uh, if your bolt score is compromised, if you breathe through your mouth, if you're, you experience any of the things we've spoken about, the most immediate thing you can start doing is, is working on breathe through your nose or breathing through your nose. But you also mentioned, as I say, uh, the three three approaches, and I love the way you made them very accessible and very easy to get your head around when you talked about breathing light. How do you know you're breathing light? And then breathing deep, what does that mean? And then the, um, oh, breathing light, I'm uh, breathing slow. slow. Can, can you give yeah. us those three? Because it'd be great to send people away with those yeah, three uh, techniques. Yeah. Yeah, an easy way to remember it is LSD. So teenagers of the 1990s, <laughs> yeah. you'll have no problem there. No problem. So in terms of breathing light, what you could do is just put one hand on your chest, just put one hand just above your navel. Bring your attention onto your breathing. And feel the slightly colder air coming into your nose and feel the slightly warmer air as it leaves your nose. And the whole objective of breathe light is to start softening the speed of the air as it comes in and out of your nose. You're taking a really soft and slow, gentle breath in, almost breathing imperceptible that you're hardly breathing at all, and a relaxed and a slow and a gentle breath out. So breathe light is about softening the speed of the inhalation and having a really relaxed and slow, gentle exhalation that your breathing is almost imperceptible. Now you're doing it correctly if you feel air hunger and the mm. air hunger that you experience should be tolerable. Okay. And I would really encourage listeners to, to practice this because if you practice this for three to four minutes, check the saliva in the mouth, likely you will have more increased water saliva in the mouth. Mm. You feel drowsy, your hand temperature is increasing and you're activating the body's relaxation response and mm. you're stimulating the vagus nerve. So the breathe light component is from a biochemical dimension of breathing. Mm. And again, just remember two things. Take a very soft and slow, almost imperceptible breath in through your nose. 
and a really relaxed and a slow and a gentle exhalation and a very soft and slow gentle breath in and a relaxed and slow gentle exhalation so that's the breathe light component mm. now breathe slow it's focusing on improving alveolar ventilation what i mean there is by by improving your efficiency in terms of breathing but also slow breathing during rest and sleep it's the communication that your body sends to the brain yeah, yeah. if you breathe fast your brain recognizes that your body is under threat and we naturally and most people don't even know it, that they're breathing fast when they're getting into a difficult situation. And the very time that they need to be able to think straight, they can't because their physiology is saying, get out of there, flee. Yeah. It's not a time for planning. So breathing slow over the last 30 years, it's when you slow down your respiratory rate to between 4.5 and 6.5 breaths per minute. Okay. Good average is about 6, 5.5, 6. This also helps to stimulate the vagus nerve to bring the body into balance. So here would be nose breathing. Hmm. You shouldn't hear your breathing. And ideally it's low. So if you if people put their hands either side of the hmm. lower two ribs, which is as follows. So you have your hands either side of your lower two ribs. And as you breathe in, you should feel the lower ribs moving out. And as you breathe out, you should feel your lower ribs moving in. And you shouldn't hear your breathing. As you breathe in, the lower ribs move out. And as you breathe out, the lower ribs move in. So it's establishing low breathing and then slowing down the breath. And you could be breathing in, two, three, four, five, out, two, three, four, five, in, two, three, four, five, out, two, three, four, five. And by practicing that, <laughs> I would say that when you're practicing breathing slow, don't overbreathe. So it's not about taking these full big breaths. Yeah. It's about having a relatively light breath, a slow breath and a low breath together. Light, slow and deep LSD. Now, when you do that exercise, you bring the body and mind into balance because you're helping to the autonomic nervous system, you're dampening the stress response, you're increasing the relaxation response. You're also helping to improve or strengthen what's called the barrel reflex, which is mm. a very important part of the autonomic nervous system. And we as human beings, we are not able to deal with stress long term. Physiologically, we've never had to cope with it throughout our evolution. All of our stresses were short term. Just think of the animal world, you yeah. know, an animal out in the wild. That animal doesn't have a long-term stress. They're typically short-term stressors. Humans were the same. We can cope very well with short-term stresses, but today's environment is very often a long-term stress. Right. Stress makes us sick. And on the basis that stress is making us sick, and when we get stressed, we're breathing harder and faster. The body can't cope with this, and this eventually can contribute to burnout and chronic fatigue syndrome. And very understudied, but one paper looked at individuals with burnout Right. That all of them are hyperventilating. All of them. Wow. So because stress causes you to breathe harder and faster. And even when you remove yourself from the situation, you, you are likely to have developed that breathing pattern. So you're mm. still stuck in that stress response. So anybody who feels stressed, take some time out and focus on breathing light and breathing slow and breathing deep. Breathe in and out through your nose during rest. Go for walks with your mouth closed. One of the best breathing exercises that you could ever do. As you go for a walk with your mouth closed, you're feeling a slight sensation of air hunger. You know that carbon dioxide is increased in the blood. As carbon dioxide increases in the blood, your blood vessels dilate. And also what's called the Bohr effect, that more oxygen gets delivered throughout the body. So it's kind of ironic that we have two major misnomers, myths in the Western world. Mm -hmm. One is the benefit of taking this deep breath, and the other is that the more air you breathe, the more oxygen delivered throughout the body. How on earth did this information get out there? And it has done a lot of harm, and so many people that I have met over the years, because they send us emails, like we have 3,000 instructors across 50 countries, so we have a lot of information that's coming into us. And many people, because of that idea, they're feeling stressed, they start taking these full big breaths, and all it's going to do is just feed into their stress response. If you're stressed, our breathing gets harder, faster, upper chest, 
mouth breathing irregular, do the opposite. Instead of breathing faster, slow down your breathing. Instead of breathing harder, breathe light, soften your breathing. Instead of breathing upper chest, breathe low. And instead of breathing irregular, with frequent sighing, Mm. have regular breathing. And you know that you're on the right path when your bolt score is increasing. Because as your bolt score is increasing, your respiratory rate is going towards normal. The minute volume is going towards normal, your breathing will tend to be lower, lighter, and slower. Okay, uh, on that, let me bring Ava back in just to see, is there, we, I, I suspect we will have, to use the Irish expression, a clatter of questions on there. And, well, that's uh, good. and we have about six or seven minutes to go, so we don't have a huge amount of road, but Ava, do you want to pick out a couple there to throw to Patrick? Sure, thanks, thanks guys. I'm they're desperately taking notes myself <laughs> for all these things too. Um, just some feedback, a lot, a lot of feedback actually. Um, one person shared that they, they had to share, they had no affiliation with you, they were just, they've had their life changed by your techniques. And I said, there's nothing wrong with being a super fan. Um, Marianne shared that her son had struggled to sleep and had ADHD, was a mouth breeder and his mental health was also so affected. Um, she does ask a question, Patrick, you know, wondering on why, why do we yawn? Is there a biological reason? I think there's probably a lot of misconceptions around that as well. Yeah, I don't think anybody knows really why we yawn. It is more frequent, though, with dysfunctional breathing patterns. So mm. somebody who has dysfunctional breathing or suboptimal breathing, they tend to sigh more and they tend to yawn more. <sighs> yeah. Mm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I know there's a physiological sigh and it's normal if you sigh every maybe eight, nine, ten minutes. Hmm. But it's not normal if you're sighing once every six minutes, once every five minutes, once every four minutes, once every three minutes. Yeah. Because the sighing itself can actually keep you stuck in that stress response. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks, William. Um, and Nicholas shared that he's introduced a carrot after dinner for the kids. Why? Well, since chewing is essential to upper jaw maxilla development, hence breathing capacity based on the skeletal development. Yeah, so I it totally agree. Yeah, and Ian yeah, shares LSD. Um, I'll remember the vagus nerve. I'll have to Google. Yeah, the vagus Sorry. nerve is basically a nerve that's wandering throughout the human body, and a lot of the information, eighty to ninety percent of the information, is from the body up to the brain. Mm-hmm. And by tapping into the vagus nerve, but also by increasing vagal tone, like I'll give you an example. Back in nineteen ninety eight, there was a neuroscientist called Kevin Tracy. And Irish surname is, is Irish or origin. Yeah. He was doing an experiment on a rash and he was stimulating the vagus nerve in the rash to, to see could it reduce inflammation. And his colleagues were out in the corridors placing bets that he couldn't do it. And he did it. Wow. He stimulated the vagus nerve and he could stop inflammation in its tracks. He then looked at human beings stimulating the vagus nerve to help alleviate rheumatoid arthritis. A wow. condition that we have no known cure, hmm. and yet we're not talking about the vagus nerve stimulation. And you can do it naturally, of course. If there was an intervention to help stimulate it electronically, you could speed it up. Hmm. But instead, too often we have this idea that let's pe- put people on these medications costing 10, 20, 30,000 euro a year, hmm. instead of looking at what could help to alleviate inflammation. And we always have to ask the response that stress has. Stress hmm. contributes to inflammation. Can we alleviate harmful inflammation by practicing breathing techniques? The theory is there. It needs more research. Mm. But the problem with breathing is it doesn't promise great profit. So there's not always that motive to do the research, but it doesn't mean that it's not helpful. Okay. Let me, because we're going to run out of road. So, so let me turn sure. to you and just ask you for somebody, for somebody who's listening to this and they say, Oh, geez, I've got to dive into this. You, you've got, you've got the breathing cure. You've got the original, the, the oxygen, or I think of it as the originals because the first one I heard of, uh, which was the oxygen yeah. advantage and then atomic focus. And, and I love them all, but if somebody wants to dive into it, would you say go back to oxygen advantage or into the, where would you advise them to start? I think atomic focus might be the simplest, um, okay. just because it's not, it's not overloaded with text. Gotcha. gotcha. Um, the breathing cure is a very it's an it's a deep dive because I wanted to show that you know there's a good foundation here. So yeah. Kevin Tracy, you to talk about he's in the breathing cure, and um, because I wanted to get this out of left of field, breathing is not left of field. It should be right down the centre, hmm. and hmm. that's where it needs to go. 
I want to see the time that somebody sitting outside an interview door that they can control their physiology before going in or mm. somebody going to give a public presentation and the very people who need to be able to control their states, those people with anxiety, those people with racing mind, those people with poor concentration, poor attention span. And the problem is nowadays with social media platforms, it is literally having youngsters practice distraction all day long. Yeah. A distracted mind, a racing mind, lost in thought is not just a recipe for poor concentration and attention span, but it's a recipe for stress, anxiety, and a poor quality of life. We need to wake up to this. Great. Thank you, Patrick. And, and on that note, let me tell you before um, we say thank you to Patrick uh, for the last time, let me tell you that Patrick does a program on the Oxygen Advantage for, uh, I'm going I'm to use my expert, end users, for, for somebody who's, it's for themselves. And correct me if I'm wrong, Patrick. And then he also does uh, an instructor or a master trainers uh, program for people who want to bring this to their clients and the people around them. And uh, we will send you the details. We'll send you the connection to Patrick's site. Um, as I said before, and I, I just, let me see if I can get it in front of me here, in fact. Yes, I can. Um, I, I'm glad actually, Patrick, that you said that the uh, uh, oxygen, or not oxygen advantage, but uh, atomic focus is a good place to start. Um, because as I was saying at the beginning in the intro, it's really beautifully illustrated. It's so accessible. You get it on Kindle, you get it in black and white, you get it in a physical copy, or you open it on the Amazon Kindle app and you get these lovely illustrations that really, really uh, bring it alive. So uh, we'll, we'll put a link up to that in the uh, Genos Live resources page and a link to the app that Patrick was talking about earlier on, the Boutieco. Uh, my pronunciation on that I know is crap. Yes, yes, yeah, it's good. That works. That's, it was good enough. Um, so, Patrick, listen, th I, I hope you can hang around for just another 90 seconds while I close down just so I can formally thank you. But on behalf of everybody, um, you know, who's uh, benefited today, thanks a million. Really appreciate it and wish you all the very, very best with the trip. Pleasure. Thanks so much, Jarek, and thanks everybody for, for stepping in. Great. And if you if you can hang for one minute, I can formally thank you. Thanks a minute. I, or thanks a minute. Thanks a million. Okay, folks. So, um, yeah, as I say, really, really beautiful book, um, uh, the way it's done on the illustrations. And it's one of the most accessible of that I've seen on that. So, so thank you uh, very much to Patrick for a really practical and useful session on a, on a critical topic. Next week, we have a session that really kind of does tie in, as, as uh, Patrick said, into the, uh, into the topic we've been talking about today. We have uh, uh, Alison Graham, and she's going to be talking about what to do when you are tired from be having to bring that resilient version of yourself uh, to bear over the last uh, couple of years. So until then, uh, I wish you all the very best. Uh, do drop us a line um, if you uh, have any further questions and we can, we can pop them on to, to, to Patrick. And please, please um, check out the, the resources page if you uh, want to get links to all of those resources that uh, Patrick mentioned. So until next week, I wish you all the very best. Take care of yourselves. Have a great week.